This is Star Talk. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. And I got with me Chuck Nice. Chuck. Hey, Neil. All right. Chuck, we, we, we do a lot of explainers together. Yes, we do. But sometimes we got to do explainers about stuff I don't know anything about. <laughs> so... Yes, in that rare occasion. <laughs> no, <stop. laughs> So we comb the countryside, and we are overdue for a show on monkeypox. Yes. We so are. Mon- it's all the rage it's, right it's now. It's all the rage. It's yeah. in fashion. The country's gone monkeypox crazy, <laughs> you know? And so uh, we found someone who was in high demand. We're just so delighted she could spare a few moments with us for one of our explainer videos. Um, please help me welcome Professor Anne Remoyne, an epidemiologist from UCLA. And welcome to Star Talk. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're in an endowed chair there. Uh, an endowed chair of infectious diseases and in public health uh, named uh, Gordon Levin. Is that one person or is that Gordon, like Gordon's Law? Gordon, Gordon Levitt, the actor? <laughs> no. <I'm just> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's two very generous people. Cool. Uh, and so Gordon and Levin. Levin, uh-huh. Gordon and Levin. You got Gordon it. Levin. You got it. And you are uniquely qualified to be in this interview and enlighten us because you've spent decades on monkeypox before anyone's thinking you you you're all in it before anybody in the rest of the world is thinking about it and you're there in the Congo the Democratic Republic of Congo mm. where monkeypox was prevalent and so That's right. we, we we have a million so, questions for So you. are you are you just prescient or <laughs> <laughs> like, did you know this was coming? Or, yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. She wanted to be ready for this moment. So therefore, tw- <laughs> 20 years ago. <laughs> 20 years ago. <laughs> Wait, you know, before yeah. we get into your, into all your business, um, does it say infectious diseases on your business card? Like, what's that like when you hand it to someone? Do they, they don't want to... Do they no themselves. longer want to touch the card? <laughs> back up a little bit. Yeah, they, 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 they immediately hand you the card right back. Like and, and uh-huh. disinfect, you know, they curl their hands. Anyway. So what's that like? Well, it's changed a lot over the last couple of years, let me tell you. Yeah. In, the, in the years before the pandemic, when you'd say epidemiologist, people would say, are you a skin doctor? <laughs> oh, ep- epidermis. epidermis. Oh, yeah. That yeah. was, the, that was the, the discussion beforehand. Now, today, everybody knows what an epidemiologist is. We've hit the mainstream. So um, uh, very, very different, very, very different than it used to be. And, and you have knowledge of value to people. So that gives that has boosted your currency, presumably, uh, out there, it, right? Yeah, I think that people now actually understand what an epidemiologist well, can you tell us? Does. Tell us. Put that on the map right for us right now. Well, an, an epidemiologist is studying patterns of disease in populations. So that's the point of epidemiology. And in terms of an infectious disease epidemiologist, I'm focusing specifically on patterns of disease in populations. I'm under trying to understand what the burden of infections are, who's getting them, why are they getting them, and how you can prevent them. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay, the so- who, what, The who, what, when, and where, why. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. So That is the mantra of an epidemiologist. There you go. So my, my area of expertise is really global infectious diseases. Uh, and you know, epidemiologists do a lot of different things. We're, uh, some of us specialize in some things, some of us specialize in others. I really specialize in infectious diseases, but I started working on monkeypox when I started working in the Democratic Republic of Congo in 2002. Uh, and at that point, uh, I, I had just finished my PhD. I started working at the National Institutes of Health and because I had worked in eradication programs, I'd worked in vaccination programs, disease surveillance. When I got to Congo, I was a program officer actually at NIH, working on a project related to malaria and pregnancy and pregnant women in Kinshasa. I sat down with the director of the national laboratory trying to understand the lay of the land. Uh, in Kinshasa, Zaire. In Kinshasa, yep. Jean-Jacques Moyembe, who's also been in the news quite a bit. He is the, the, the Congolese doctor who really was the first person to discover Ebola in 1976, had been leading the, the work at the well, National Well, you all know Academy. each other, as you must, right? Otherwise, you can't well, communicate anything, right? Or, well, I mean, that was the first person I sat down with. I mean, he, he was really wonderful. And he started telling me about this problem of monkeypox and that there seemed to be a lot of cases. But at the time, uh, nobody was interested in analyzing these samples. It just monkeypox wasn't on the radar. Everybody was busy with other things. And so I actually took 
uh, my per diem and help send those samples that have been sitting at the national lab to a collaborating lab in Germany who analyzed them and found out that there was a lot of monkeypox in there. The supposition was, is there might be some smallpox, might, or, sorry, some chicken pox, some monkeypox, but, but probably not all that much. We were very surprised at how much monkeypox was there. And so that was really the beginning of this project that we demonstrated that there was a lot of monkeypox there. And then we started an entire research program together to be able to really do intensified disease surveillance and show that there was a lot more there. So you keep look, saying monkeypox. I know. I'm, 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 as a lay I'm person, distracted by that too. Yeah, you just keep saying monkeypox. And uh, I just want to know, first of all, I mean, I know I've done a bunch of reading because it's all crazy now. Ah, you know, everybody freaking out. And I know that it's, you know, a zoonosis virus. We know that it, I, I hear these terms, clades. I hear this term, uh, West African basin, Congo basin. Uh, what is all of this? What is all that? Well, okay. So monkeypox. Monkeypox is a zoonotic disease, meaning it starts in animals uh, and re it resides in animals, but can cross over into humans. Uh, monkeypox is traditionally been circulating in, in animals in sub-Saharan Africa. It's, it's a misnomer, monkeypox is a misnomer. Monkeypox is called monkeypox because it was first discovered in, in a monkey colony, uh, a research colony in Denmark in 1958. So they called it monkeypox, but it really turns out this is a rodent pox. So it's No, it's mostly a Denmark pox. <laughs> <laughs> it is what's rotten <laughs> in the state of Denmark. Okay, I see what you did there, Chuck. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right. So, sorry, I, 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 we interrupted you. Please, yeah, we did. Please repeat that with Denmark. So please. it's really a rodent pox. Okay. Okay. Go on. It's really a rodent pox, and it, uh, it, it resides. We, we think that the reservoir species are squirrels, uh, pouch rats other rodent species. It probably actually infects a lot of different rodent species. Uh, but that's, so monkeys can get it from rodents, just like humans can. Right. So it, and it, now, so wait a minute, let's look at this chain of uh, trans transference here. Monkeys get it from the rodents. Does it then mutate in the monkeys and then they give it to us? Or do they just pass it along to us? Monkeys can be incidental hosts. It's, you know, okay. in DRC, most often, the cases of monkeypox in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Right. Republic of Congo uh, uh, most of the cases are associated with squirrels, uh, other other wow. rodent species. Oh. Sometimes people will pick up a monkey that may have a rash on it, right. um, may have been infected, and they'll get it from from eating a, a monkey. But really, monkeys. You know, primates, humans, non-human primates, we're all incidental hosts. This is real virus that that starts in rodents. And by the way, you're just, scaring the crap out of me right now. Okay, just, Be, go ahead, Leo. I'm just saying, maybe because I'm a city person, but you just said, oh, if you pick up a monkey and they have a rash, they could be, I'm saying, I'm never picking up a monkey. Right. <laughs> that, that is not a thing that and, I and, ever think of doing. All and right. piggybacking on that, <laughs> what Neil just said, I'm thinking, you know, monkeypox. Okay, here's the deal. I don't hang out with monkeys. I'm good. Okay, like I'm never. I, I'm not going to run into any monkeys. Okay, here in New York City, so I'm okay. But now that you say it's a rodent pox, I know. you're talking about rodents and squirrels. Okay, now I'm scared because we got a lot of those. Yeah. yeah so yeah. Uh, yes, we do, and that's going to bring me. I mean. We're, we're, you're already you're already ahead of the story, but let me tell you that is exactly some of the things that I'm worried about. So here's By the way, what, what, we what know you about just monkeypox. what she just told you, Chuck, is let her finish the damn story. <laughs> 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 uh, let me translate the yeah. professor's I'm, comment. I'm motivated by fear here. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, go, go. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the deal. I'll try and make this this quick. So the the, the situation is this: is that monkeypox has been spreading for a very long time. We didn't know monkeypox was out there because it looks just like smallpox, which is a cousin of monkeypox. And when we eradicated monkeypox or smallpox from the planet, we stopped vaccinating against pox viruses. And as a result, we started to see some some chinks in our herd immunity armor. Uh, and so what happened was, is over time, as people were no longer vaccinated, people 
when they came in contact with a rodent or a monkey, they would get infected. This would be people and, below a certain age, right? Well, it started out that what we really thought of this was is a childhood disease. So in principle, it was children that were in contact with, with animals. And actually, the very first case of monkeypox in a human was discovered in the Democratic Republic of Congo in 1970 in a nine-month-old child who had not been vaccinated. And this was when they were at the end of smallpox eradication, they were looking for every single case of uh, a pox-like illness and making sure that it wasn't a case of smallpox. That's part of the certification process for eradicating for extinct. the virus. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And so that's how they discovered it was monkeypox. Uh, once they eradicated monkeypox in or smallpox in humans from the planet, what they did was they they decided it's really important to understand what's going on with monkeypox here. Is this going to be important? Is this something that's going to fill the ecologic niche? We don't know. So they started a program in DRC uh, to monitor it. And really, the vast majority of the work that we that you know is the basis of You're understanding monkeypox is from 1981 to 1986. Uh, in DRC. And it was really mostly children because you think about it, if everybody was vaccinated and they only stopped vaccinating in 82, it was really only young children that had any susceptibility to this virus. And that's why there's so, there's so little known. So when I got to DRC in, uh, in 2002, you know, there were all these suspected cases of monkeypox and, and, and a lot of rumors of cases increasing. And it made sense because we no longer had immunity. So we started this project in DRC, Professor Moyambe and I together. And we started doing intensified disease surveillance and we ended up having a, a, a real understanding that there was a huge increase in monkeypox since the 1980s, since immunization stopped. So we wrote a paper, it was in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences and showed this this 20-fold rise in the incidence of monkeypox since the end of smallpox vaccination campaigns. And that should have been a big warning to everybody because that just showed that, listen, as immunity goes down yeah. and exposure goes up, you're going to see cases go up. Let me go back a little bit. If we all know, may, many people know, that the immunity that some milkmaids had to smallpox uh, came right. from their exposure to cowpox. Cowpox. Are you saying that the people most susceptible today to monkeypox are people young enough to have not gotten a smallpox vaccine? Because does a smallpox vaccine protect you against monkeypox in today's world? Neil, that is exactly what I'm saying. Wow. Uh, so how uh, old do you have to be to have a smallpox vaccine? I, I've got a scar. I got my smallpox. How about Chuck, you, Chuck? You're Chuck, 10 years younger you? than I am. I'm, sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I don't know. 75? What's that do? <laughs> <laughs> you got one. You're sure, too young. Sure, you got uh, a scar on your skull? I got one. No, no I no. don't. I don't Chuck, have a scar. Were you, no. Chuck, were you born here in the United States? Yeah. Okay, well, then then you you wouldn't have been yeah. vaccinated. I Vaccination little... in the United States stopped in 71. So now, how does it spread? So so wait a minute. Just another point here that it it is it, smallpox vaccination probably does provide some protective immunity, but we don't really know how much in this particular outbreak. And because there are all these different modes of transmission that aren't the standard modes of transmission that we've been studying all these years, we just don't know for sure. So wow. Chuck, you don't, you don't have to feel that jealous of Neil. You guys can both be jealous of me. <laughs> I've been vaccinated. <laughs> and last, okay. I was vaccinated <laughs> in 2004. Okay. So sooner than both of you, just because I work yeah. on monkeypox. You, you, got, you, you got the industrial strength super concentrated. <laughs> uh, I did. Yeah, MPXV like solution. Uh, okay, but, so this is, this is on the skin. So can we presume it doesn't ever go airborne? Well, I always say we, we should be humble about what we know and what we don't know about this virus. Uh, what we know about this virus is really, as I mentioned before, really concentrated in those early studies in the 1980s in, in villages, in remote rural villages in Congo. And that is a very different context. And so you, know, you can imagine that the studies that we have, we have some animal model studies, we have a little bit of knowledge from what happened in the 2000s. There was a small outbreak in the United States in 2003, 47 cases from imported Gambian rats that were put into a facility next to prairie dogs. So why it, would it, anyone import a rat? What, <laughs> Just, what, what is going on? 
Bats and rats and <laughs> monkeys and what is going on? Listen, don't shoot the messenger here. Okay, I'm just, <laughs> damn. Damn. So, uh, I'm just thinking so, of the sewer rats in New York. Say, Look, this is our place. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> tell me about it. Import African rats into the <laughs> sewers. All right, the exotic so, pet trade. That's a whole different That's topic, another, another. But, oh, my gosh. How, how do we stop this? Well, that's a really good question. So as we're talking about these, so the way that we stop it is we have to get in front of it. How do we get in front of it? We have to have really good disease surveillance. We have to, to really have good situational awareness. We have to have great testing. Testing has to be widely available to everyone that that even suspects that they've been, uh, that they have potentially been exposed. You left out the most obvious answer. Stop touching each other. <laughs> Isn't I'm that all for guy? that one. I'm for that one. <laughs> well, on these Zoom calls make it much easier. Well, I, I know. I know. Until Zoom figures out a way to transmit a virus through the computer, you know, the Zoom call is the great protector of, of, of us all. Well, there you go. But the, but the truth is, is it's going to be through a, a variety of things. So we've got to have really good situational awareness. That's testing, good clinical definitions. So clinicians know what to look for when somebody comes in and has something that might this. Then we also have really good vaccines. Now, there are a couple of vaccines that are out there. Uh, there's the Genios vaccine, which is this vaccine. It's a two-dose vaccine, uh, and that's what's being distributed right now, but it's in really short supply, so we just don't have enough of it. Uh, and and we, we don't really know how effective it's going to be, in particular in this scenario. So every day is a new set of data for you. Every yeah. day is a new set of data. And there are a lot of knowledge gaps, a lot of things we have to understand. We have to be humble about what we know. We have a good base to start from, but there's a lot more we need to know. And, uh, you know, you've been in academia. It's really, it takes a lot of time to be able to get studies up and running, to be able to understand what's happening. I mean, it's not just that, that today it, it, there's a, a new virus and you can turn around and start it. You have to, to write protocols. You have to get funding. You have to get ethics approval. You have to then have the logistics of rolling these things out. So it does take a lot of time to get this done. And this is the fact we just don't have the funding and the infrastructure in place to be able to do what we need to do. How transmissible is this? How can I get it? Actually, how can I not get it? That's the real question. That's the real question. Yeah. That's a really excellent question. It, it you know, it transmits through various routes. Uh, it's not as transmissible as something like SARS-CoV-2, virus that causes COVID-19. Uh, it, it transmits most efficiently from person to person, skin to skin contact, sustained contact, very close contact, but it can also transmit through what we call fomites, contaminated objects. So sheets, towels, uh, clothing, contaminated objects. Uh, and and so it's probably much more contagious the closer you are the the more virus you're in contact with and so when you're in contact with the with the lesions that it causes um, direct contact that is probably the most efficient route for transmission and that sexual transmission is is perfect example of that i remember reading about the milkmaids they were very specific about it they would have to have an open sore while they were milking a cow with cowpox exactly so so if my skin is intact uh how does someone else's monkeypox get into my skin well my not I mean, okay, skin okay. can be a, a good barrier. It just, it really depends because you can have little micro skin. Th I'm a thick and... skin person. Okay. <laughs> yeah. it could, you could have, you might not know how thin your skin actually is until you try, you uh, test until it. Until you do so, it. Okay. Okay. Um, so that, that's one way. I mean, you could also get it through respiratory secretions. You could be breathing it in, inhaling it. Um, but it's, it's, there, there are a variety of different ways to get it. But I think Respiratory the, secretion, that would be like a sneeze or a cough. Right, right. Okay, okay. So bigger okay. respiratory droplets that, that you might uh, expel when coughing or sneezing. Beyond skin lesions, how might monkeypox also show up on your body? Monkeypox also, it infects, it can, you'll have lesions in the oropharynx, it can be down your throat, it can, uh, it causes what's called a cytokine storm, which is similar, SARS-CoV-2 also does that. So you could see, you're going to have a, a massive inflammatory response. You know, people, there, there were just two cases of, of uh, individuals in Spain that died from, um, 
from inflammation, from, from brain inflammation, from uh, in, in encephalitis. And and so this but can triggered be by the monkey very triggered by monkeypox. So this wow. can be a very serious disease. It, fatality rates are low relative to other things. And in particular, this this West African clade, not the Congo Basin clade. So this the West African clade is what's circulating, and that tends to be milder. But th there have been a few deaths. And of course, the more cases that we see, the more likely that is. And of course, when it gets into people who might have a suppressed immune system, yeah, it, it could be a lot worse. Um, can it cause blindness? In some it people? can. It can. And there we've seen many instances of that in DRC, uh, where where we have a, a fair number of cases that mm. that it can in fact cause blindness if you can get if the virus gets into your eye it can um, really do some damage so you know and, and and a reminder too it isn't even just about these very acute um, uh, problems that that we have really learned in the last several years how important it is um, how how viruses can create a lot of long-term consequences. It isn't just about the acute infection today, which is substantial and painful and scary and, um, and uh, can be very distressing. But, you know, we've, we've learned a lot about what viruses can do uh, and, and causing long-term consequences. I think that once we get more vaccine into the system and have better surveillance and better testing, that we will we will have this under much better control, and I do not anticipate that this will end up being something like SARS-CoV-2, where you see uh, you know you, that, that everybody's going to to have to be taking precautions all the time. That's a very different kind of virus; spreads very differently. I know we're I know we're getting out of time, but I, this is a philosophical question because uh, it. In America, we tend to think of infectious disease as something that we need to protect ourselves from. But the more and more it looks like the world is closing in on us. So do we need to change our thinking like it is an investment for us to fight disease outside of this country so that we can protect ourselves inside the country? Chuck, absolutely. I mean, I, I say this all the time. An infection anywhere is potentially an infection everywhere. And we really do need to take that to heart because you you live in a global community. Yes. And and what happens elsewhere eventually can affect you yourself at home. Uh, and, and so that's why we, we need to be doing better. We could have averted this situation with monkeypox if we had invested in helping countries like DRC be able to understand what was happening and get in front of it. But we failed to do so. And now we are paying the price. And this falls under, I also say this quite a bit, it's much easier to stay out of trouble than it is to get out of trouble. And now we are in get out of trouble mode once again, when we had the writing on the wall for a very long time. Well, all I can say is you and your fellow epidemiolo epidemiologists, especially those who are specifically focused on, on legislation that affects public health, um, I, I don't know where we'd be without you. I mean, maybe we'd all still be in the caves dying of everything else that mm. we look at these woodcuts and paintings of, of, you know, the Black Plague and all of this. So I... I I, I don't think you guys are, are hero worshipped as much as you should be. And let me add to that, that Chuck, I, I don't know if you noticed, the candor with which Anne spoke of what they don't yet know. Right. Okay, that's how you know she's a real academic. Absolutely. But what happens is, and what's wrong with you? You spent your life and you still don't know? I did two hours of research and I know way more than you on the <laughs> internet. And I'm gonna have I'm gonna have a podcast and I'm gonna tell yeah. everyone what I do know and you should listen to me. That's what's come going you on. I don't know stuff when I was on TikTok and I just learned everything about it. Yeah. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so so and my last question to you, because this is a, a shared space in our two Venn diagrams. Um, what do you do about misinformation and Ooh. rampant uh, or people taking what they think is information and politically weaponizing it, socially, culturally weaponizing it. What do you do as a public health professional? As a public health professional, I try to go on podcasts 
for no. example. <laughs> what <laughs> an idea. <laughs> audiences here. No, Very but, good. But, but, but why didn't we think of that? Why didn't we think of that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but, but it's really true. What things that you have to do are you have to get out there in front of it and you have to be vocal and you have to get in to as many different places as you possibly can. And you don't always want to just talk to the people who are agreeing with you. You want to talk to everybody and you have to be willing to listen to everybody too, because it's reasonable to have questions. It's reasonable to, to, to question, to question things, including questioning scientists. But sometimes you end up with, with, with social media today, the, the speed with which disinformation gets out there. Um, it's, it's very hard to combat. It's very hard to get in front of. Yeah. That's like the quote from Mark Twain. Um, uh, in the early morning, uh, uh, you know, when you wake up, a lie can make it halfway around the world before the truth has a chance to put on its pants. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I'm maybe misquoting it a little bit, but that's pretty much what he said. Uh, anyhow, and this has been, I don't want to say delightful because you're telling us about infectious diseases, but it's been highly enlightening and informative. And as monkeypox continues to develop, either to go back in the can or escape even more can we get you back on to get an update Could we? absolutely i'll be happy to come on anytime delighted okay thank you very much for being on star talk chuck always good to have you always a pleasure hey and 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 where do we find you on social media uh you can find me on twitter at a ramoin uh and, and also, ramoin is r-i-m-o-i-n you yeah. bet and also on instagram at ann ramoin okay excellent we'll look for you there keep us keep us enlightened keep us informed uh, keep us smart. And you've already been doing a great job at that. All right. This has been Star Talk. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. As always, keep looking up.